It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Eve Hilpish. Uh, Dr. Eve Hilpish is the founder and the managing partner of the Python Quants GmbH. He's also a lecturer in uh, mathematical finance at uh, Saarland uh, University, and he's written two books about Python and finance. So Eve, take it away. Thanks, Valentin. <laughs> Happy to see a couple of you after lunch, so I hope you, you won't fall asleep. I do my best. Um, before I start and go into interactive analytics of large financial data sets, how many of you are, work, are working in finance or in something related? Uh, not too many. Should have marketed to different target groups. However, I think um, the things that I will present today are also kind of useful uh, for other areas, of course. I mean, Python is not constrained to the finance area. It has become uh, a little bit more popular recently with large banks like Bank of America and, for example, JP Morgan making heavy use of Python, also larger hedge funds that are well known to be heavy Python users. For example, Pandas, of course, that you might all use is an outgrowth of, uh, of a hedge fund, actually, where they have problems with managing time series data, financial time series data, uh, with Python. So Wes McKinney started back then working on something similar to R. But we come to that later on. Um, another question, how many of you are using IPython? Everybody, so it's kind of, over the years when I've been asking this question, it's kind of like exponential growth, I think we are now, it looks like a, a cumulative distribution function when we're now nearing the 100%, so in a sense. Everybody's using it um, to some extent, at least. Um, of course, what I present here, and you might notice it, is kind of an IPython notebook-based presentation, HTML5. Uh, if you go to my Twitter feed, um, you uh, will find the link, so just Google me up on Twitter, uh, you will find the link to the slides when you're interested in, but you can also have a look at the uh, URL up there. It's hosted on my private website, hildbisch.com. A few words about myself. I mean, Valentin already mentioned um, most of it. Um, I want to maybe highlight two more points. Um, as he said, doing consulting, training, technology, I'm a lecturer, uh, but I'm also a co-organizer of the For Python Quants conference in New York. James mentioned it in a talk earlier, and uh, we will bring that most probably this autumn to London uh, in cooperation, most probably with CQF and uh, Future Learning. And I'm also organizing two meetup groups. So if you're by chance based in uh, Berlin, you might consider our meetup group Python Big Data Analytics. So we had our inaugural uh, meetup back then in May, uh, with also kind of a good participation. Um, if you are in finance and happen to be in London, maybe, I'm running the Python Quant Finance Group there. Um, this, uh, from my point of view, kind of a successful thing. We had, in total, since May, four different events, and this is kind of a vibrant community, similar to New York, where we also right now uh, have a Python for Quant Finance Group, which will have the first meetup next week. So, if you're interested in the things, there are lots of ways to interact with us, actually. Um, I've written the book Python for Finance. Uh, I finished my editing so far, so I'm waiting for O'Reilly to get the copy editing right, and it will be printed most probably, and will be available in November. So uh, the early the early release version is available as ebook, um, and we will release chapter after chapter uh, when O'Reilly uh, says that's fine. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you might have a look. Many of the examples that I present, I've taken out of the book. Um, that you will see today. IPython, why is it so popular? I mean, many people come to Python via IPython because in the recent past, when you think back many, many years, when, when we started out 10 years ago uh, using Python for finance, uh, it was already kind of a nice language with a nice syntax, but um, nice tools were missing back then, mainly. Um, so today, it's a little bit the other way around that we have so nice tools, that other languages, other ecosystems are eager to like adapt that. I mean, the, the recent development uh, with the Jupyter project and separating kind of the Python kernel stuff and everything from the uh, front end, the IPython notebook, uh, is kind of a good indicator for that. Um, many people, <laughs> we just had a discussion before my presentation at lunch, is IPython an IDE? I mean, in the end, it's not. 
Um, so I just call it a, a powerful, I don't know, development environment. You could also say this is kind of an interactive exploratory tool that you can use to interact with data. You have the three flavors. So I, I'm using the Appathon Shell and, and Notebook quite intensively. A QT console, I think, is not uh, that needed anymore uh, in a sense. In a, but in addition, you need many other things. Of course, you need kind of an uh, integrated Python distribution consistent. So, uh, but once you have that, I mean, this is kind of pretty simple. The only thing that needs a license, for example, what I'm mentioning here is Sublime Text, but there are many free editors as well, so like a Spider, but you can do all the things that I present here today, even if you're just a student studying finance, and this is kind of one of the beautiful things when you're talking about like interactive financial data analytics, nothing only for like large hedge funds or large banks that have huge budgets and huge clusters or whatever. Uh, so this is something that you can do even as a student um, at the university today on your machine, and I can uh, still remember pretty well when I was studying, I had to go to my professor and I had to pay for data that I needed. So even as a student, I had to pay for like regular stock prices back then. And these times have um, fortunately changed actually. Uh, just uh, my talk will be, I would very, very briefly review what we are using in the uh, financial ecosystem, but it's kind of the, the standard scientific stack in the end. Um, just remembering what, what is kind of the, or what are the workhorses uh, that we all rely on. And then I will show how to apply this in a financial context and how to uh, process large data. And large data can mean that we have uh, lots of historical data stored on disk, for example. But it can also mean, and this is something we are heavily involved in, that you simulate the future and that you do heavy uh, Monte Carlo simulations where the data doesn't sit uh, maybe on the disk and you have to retrieve it, but the data is generated on the fly and you have to crunch like gigabytes, terabytes of data that is um, generated um, just in time, if you like. Many, many banks do these uh, things, or they have to do it, uh, due to regulatory reasons and due to management reasons overnight, where they have kind of really computationally demanding uh, things to implement. But NumPy, of course, I mean, we are at PyData, <laughs> so like, that they have to introduce uh, NumPy, but just to remember, it provides us with a basic building block typically to store data, and in particular financial data. Um, so the beauty comes not only that it's kind of a very efficient data store, but you have all the convenience that you say you have the vectorized operations, you have aggregation operations like the mean, standard deviation. So uh, typical things that you need when you're doing finance uh, and or scientific uh, things uh, in Python. Uh, but was also, of course, when we talk about interactive analytics, the uh, visualization of data is also really, really, from my point of view, uh, convenient in a sense. Of course, people are complaining that, well, it's not that uh, beautiful uh, as ggplot from R and so forth. But nevertheless, I mean, here you have two lines of code and you have visualized the data that you want to visualize, even attached a method uh, to your to your NumPy and the array object set, which uh, kind of access you're interested in. So even for a student, not being a programmer or a domain expert, not being an expert programmer, uh, it's pretty simple to do uh, the things that I present here today. But more often than not, we have, uh, at least in the finance space, but also in physics, many, many other areas, we have a time series data and not only like numerical data in any kind of uh, format like a vector or matrix cube or uh, even more dimensions. Uh, so pandas comes now into play and I mentioned it already, pandas has its origins in the financial context. So um, hedge funds, of course, like any other financial institution, have to deal with huge amounts of time series data and uh, Wes McKinney a couple of years ago started developing pandas at uh, AQR Capital Management, a heavy Python user still these days. Um, so many, many billions, if not trillions uh, of money are managed based on Python programs. So uh, it's also kind of uh, maybe an indicator for the success. Of course, we can add to the, to the data that we had before, kind of a time index here generated with the date range function, um, such that in the end we have uh, a little bit more a rich structure where we have the daytime information attached. And what Pandas also provides is kind of even a higher level of abstraction, even a higher level of convenience. And this is what brings also many people, when I mentioned uh, iPython notebook, for example, people like it and interaction and so forth, it's for free. Uh, but what people bring to Pandas, it's kind of the very high level abstraction uh, that people can reach results pretty, pretty quickly by using uh, what Pandas actually provides in the end. And again, it makes for example, plotting even more easy. From my point of view, Pandas makes a wonderful job in like integrating the wonderful libraries of the scientific stack into one package. We say, well, it relies on PyTables, HDFI for data storage. It relies on Matplotlib for plotting. Uh, it uses num expression for the fast evaluation and parallel evaluation of a numerical expression and so forth. So it's very, it brings the, the high level of abstraction even one level higher, if you like. And in the end, you can have kind of very complex analytical task in a single line of code. And there are not too many languages where you can say that. 
I mentioned already pie tables for hardware bound I.O. It's kind of a very wonderful library. We have the, the main author here sitting. I see him, Francesc. Uh, welcome to the talk. Um, why, why is it good to use um, HF5 and pie tables in particular for financial data? I mean, usually we are dealing in finance with time series data, as I said it, and it's, it's typically data that can be pretty easily stored in tables. That's the reason why most of the financial institutions are still using uh, relational databases, stored of data. Um, but here you might have advantages by using a different format than SQL because not everything needs to rely on the complex relations on the complex SQL queries and so forth. Uh, but just to, to make a, a brief example how you can get to, to a hardware bound I.O., you see here I generate a, a ND array object with uh, uh, pseudo-random numbers here and this has a size of a gigabyte. The in-memory generation um, takes nine seconds, um, but the one gigabyte of data here is written in a little bit more than a second. So using SSD drives, having a read-write speed of, as of today, like in this notebook, 512 megabytes per second uh, makes writing and reading data faster than the in-memory generation of our array. So this is kind of amazing, and when you think of things uh, like Intel um, coming out with kind of standard commodity SSD drives having a reading speeds of 2 gigabyte per second and writing speeds of 1.5 gigabyte per second, and you can uh, get these for, uh, I don't know, around 1,000 US. Uh, this is kind of a real uh, improvement when it gets to I.O. And Python makes it pretty easy to harness the power of this I.O. So getting to hardware-bound I.O. speeds is kind of what uh, makes the beauty, at least from my point of view, because you're still working in a very Pythonic way. There are no tricks. There's not like low-level uh, things, uh, stuff that you have to do. You can get uh, the results and you can get to the machine that is available and, and to the limits of the machine pretty, pretty easily. Here the reading, of course, there's some kind of buffering in place. Uh, the read speed is not that high, but buffering allows to uh, read it pretty, pretty fast here in this way in memory. And you see the uh, data frame that I read in here uh, really owns the data. But let me come to some applications. I mean, it's about finance, not about a scientific stack. But all we've seen will now be applied to financial context. Let's start with kind of a, a very typical, one of the canonical examples in, in finance is portfolio optimization. The problem of saying, well, I have a universe of stocks that I can invest in. For example, think of a DAX index or the S&P 500 or the Eurostoxx 50 index, the major indices of the world, and you have a couple of uh, stocks, of course, included in there. Um, and the question is, what is kind of the right mix? What, what is the best mix for me in terms of like either minimizing risk or getting the most out of it in terms of return over time? So this is what, typically what investors are uh, interested in. Maybe the third dimension might be to have kind of the right mix between return and risk. Um, and here, to make it uh, simple and to have not too many, uh, I'm using uh, five symbols, five, if you say vehicles, stocks. It's not only stocks, there's also ETFs included in here, which says it's Apple stock, we have considered the Google stock, the Microsoft stock, Deutsche Bank from Germany, and also a certificate for gold, which is kind of a commodity product, uh, where ETFs are a pretty easy way to invest in. So the question is, now I have this, and I have maybe 100,000, I have a million to invest, or even only 1,000, uh, what is the best mix for me given the historical performance of these. And this problem was actually solved, if you like, or the first rigorous statistical approach was uh, invented back then in the 50s, 1952, and later on a, a Nobel Prize was awarded for that. Uh, Markowitz uh, won that, uh, which says, well, in principle, we only have to take care of the uh, standard deviation of the volatility of the returns um, and of the, uh, respect, uh, of the expected returns. but. Uh, let me come to that uh, after we have the data available. So we have decided upon five different symbols. Uh, here, using pandas, again, on a very high level, I have the data reader function, which you find in the pandas.io.data uh, sub-library, and I can pretty easily, and I mentioned the example of me being a student, having to pay a professor to getting data. So now you sit here in your iPython notebook shell, you have an internet connection, and you get the data for whatever time frame is available or you ask for. And we get the closing data from Google as a data source, and we store it in a um, data frame. Only a couple of lines of code, and we have the data for our five symbols stored in there. So now I can pretty easily store that on disk, and you see it's only, it's not a large data set, it's a small data set, it's written in 10 milliseconds here, but nevertheless I just want to illustrate it's also pretty easy to use uh, pie tables via uh, pandas because there again is kind of a real high level abstraction uh, in the API built into pandas. Visualization is pretty easy, and you see here I also do a kind of vectorized operations that normalize the stocks. Of course, 
or the, the, um, the investment vehicles in general, because it's not only stocks that I mentioned. Um, I can do vectorized operations pretty simple uh, here in this case. And you see I have kind of now normalized plot and you see Apple has performed the best over the years, uh, even if there was kind of a bad period. But I think Deutsche Bank, our German bank was the worst performing. But nevertheless, you might expect um, some kind of diversification effect, as we call it in finance, when we mix the portfolio. So usually you would say, if you're only interested in kind of the highest return, then you would go with Apple, probably, because this had, over uh, recent years, the best performance on average, but there's also some kind of risk. You see, Apple has been performing well, but the volatility, you see it kind of the minimum, maximum, the drawdowns and so forth, is, of course, a little bit higher. But let us get a little bit more rigorous and formal. Here in this case, I again do a completely vectorized operation by dividing the data frame by itself, shifted by one index day. <laughs> so it's kind of a very compact way to calculate the log returns on a daily basis over a whole uh, data frame. So there's nothing like a for loop or whatsoever that you would typically have to implement maybe using another language. C, C++ uh, would be good examples for that. Uh, again, calling a method and scaling that, I end up with the um, annualized returns. And you see here, Deutsche Bank was the worst performer. And I said, Apple, you've seen it in the chart, is the best performer. But there's uh, something in addition to consider when we talk about portfolio. This is the, the correlation, the covariance uh, between the single stocks. And here you see that uh, even, let's say, a little bit more complex statistics is uh, as easily calculated as the mean, for example. So just calling the covariance method gives you back a, um, a, uh, a frame with all the different uh, values uh, given the stocks in, uh, in the data frame, actually. But coming to the mathematics, and I only have included that. It's kind of not uh, that important to understand it at that point. But what is important when you do portfolio analytics is kind of the return of a whole portfolio. This is given mainly by the weights that you assign. The weight, in a sense, I invest 20% into Apple, 30% into Microsoft or whatever. In the end, it should add up to 100%. This is what, in the end, is kind of a linear thing, um, determines what I can expect given the historical performance. If historical performance is some kind of indicator for the future, I would say, well, it performed that in the past, and I expect this on average for the future. When it comes to the resulting risk, which means to the variations, to the volatility in the end, then the covariance plays a role. Um, here you see kind of, uh, again, the, we've seen it already numerically, but here you see the definition of the covariance matrix. Again, it's not that important to understand it here. I just want to have the mathematical representation and then compare this to the Python implementation. Um, and in the end, what is important is the portfolio variance. And here you see that the uh, covariance matrix is kind of the major input factor here. You see, this is what was defined here. And we use the covariance matrix in the end to come up with kind of a two times dot product. Again, the weights, of course, play a role. And given the covariance matrix, we end up with a variance value for the portfolio. That's the reason why it's called mean variance. So if the mean return and the variance of the portfolio, which are in the end the um, important statistics. So I can put all the calculations given my data frame on a single slide. So there's a little bit of mathematics involved if you read the original article. I remember myself sitting in a library and going over this, doing it by pencil and paper. Uh, it's pretty hard, but you see here, using vectorized approaches, using NumPy universal functions and a dot function and whatever uh, stuff is, is provided as a convenience method in the data frame, you see it's only a couple of lines of code that I need. Actually, this is only to get to the weights, to uh, a random weight distribution here, so I don't decide upon something, just a random weight distribution, and this is the implementation of all the mathematics. Here you see the expected portfolio return, the expected portfolio variance, uh, so it's actually only two lines of code to get the mathematics right in this case, and here is kind of the volatility, because typically uh, you rather want to measure it in, in volatility terms, standard deviation and not invariance, but this is ju just an, an additional line of code, if you like, but two lines of code to implement in a highly vectorized fashion the whole mathematics applied to that. But let us have a look. Here we only uh, do Monte Carlo simulation, drawing 2,500 uh, random portfolio weights, so to say. 
it's kind of the monkey thing. I don't know if you ever heard of that. The, the Wall Street Journal did, does it for since 50 years or what, where they have the monkey throwing a dart to the, to the Wall Street Journal, and then uh, this is uh, what, what, the, what the monkey uh, spots is kind of picked to a portfolio, and the monkey, the monkey almost ever won against the most professional portfolio manager. So it's kind of uh, the reasoning that the market is efficient, and even if you analyze whatever you want to analyze, you can't beat the market, and the monkey in that sense is the market because he's like randomly selecting something. And this is what we're doing here. We just randomly select uh, out of the possible combinations, and you see it here like um, the distribution in terms of expected return versus expected volatility. And the sharp ratio is actually in a simplified fashion here that we divide the expected return, like 10% per annum, uh, by the expected volatility, like 20% uh, on an annual basis, and you get uh, the ratio here in colors. Because this is kind of the, the investor's measure. The higher the sharp ratio, the better. Uh, the single measure expected return, nor the single measure expected volatility, doesn't mean that much, but the combination of both uh, means already quite a lot. So you would always target for the red ones, not the blue ones. They are cold, so they're freezing as an, as an investor. The red ones are the good, then you're hot in the market. Uh, but this is not uh, actually what you're looking for, kind of random distributions. When you're doing this statistical implementations, um, you want to optimize things. And optimize, in that sense, means given a certain risk of the portfolio, you want to have the highest return. Or the other way around, uh, given a fixed return or a target return, you want to minimize the risk. So, of course, you have to fix one to optimize the other. And this is what we're doing here right now, uh, using the cyber optimize. A function, uh, and they recently like uh, generalized it, the minimize function, where we kind of constraint optimizations. Here you see we have uh, two equations that we use, uh, certain methods, we provide boundaries uh, for the asset weights, uh, and in the end, hopefully end up with something optimal, and here you see the efficient frontier, and this is actually what we're interested in, the crosses, not the dots. The dots were random, and of course the random ones, they sometimes uh, hit the efficient frontier, but more often than not, they don't hit the efficient frontier. Um, so this is what you're interested in when you're doing portfolio analytics, this actually line where I say, well, given a certain risk, I can get the highest return, or the other way around, given a certain, um, given a certain target return, this is the minimum risk. And here, you will find the minimum variance or minimum volatility portfolio. Coming to another application, principal component analysis. Who of you uses PCA? I mean, this is not only used in finance, this is kind of <laughs> a standard method. Uh, so a couple of you. Um, so what you do is kind of uh, determining the principal components and uh, reproducing the performance of a index. Because an index, a stock index like a DAX, is composed of 30 stocks in the case of the DAX. And of course, the performance of the 30 stocks of the DAX make up the performance of the, of the overall index. Uh, but principal but they are, of course, highly correlated and so forth. What we want to do is kind of to uh, derive princi principal components that are not correlated, uh, but are linear combinations of the single uh, assets included in there, and to like, try to replicate the performance of the, uh, of the index, actually. And this is an approach used by a couple of investment managers, a certain kind of investment approach, that they say, well, let us determine the principal components and we use these because they are not correlated to, uh, for example, mimic the performance of an index. Here we work right now with a little bit more data. This is actually indeed the DAX index and all the 30 names, the ticker symbols are here included. And again, I read it in with two lines of code. I read in all the symbols, 31, the 30 plus the DAX. In a highly vectorized fashion, once again, I determine, I calculate the log returns and I drop uh, not number values because the, the PCA function uh, doesn't work with it. So I get rid of uh, not number values because we're doing the lock returns and so forth and minus uh, there might be a couple of these. So pretty convenient and in the end we have something like this. You see the time series here on the left hand side, you see the single names and this is kind of a large, a huge matrix, 30 names, 30 columns and over a period of uh, four years or three and a half years here in this case. Uh, we pick out or take out, pop out the, uh, the ducks. Um, here in this case, you see the, the distribution, the frequency distribution of the ducks returns. Obviously not normal. We have fat tails, we have high peaks and so forth. Uh, so the basic assumption of most financial models uh, fails, even for the most common indices. But nevertheless, let us work with it. Let us implement the PCA. We scale the data to have uh, 
zero mean and one standard deviation, then fit the data to uh, our scale function here, uh, the kernel PCA from the scikit-learn library. And in the end, what I do is kind of uh, determine uh, the explanatory power. And here you see the first 10 principal components. Um, it's 10, but it's here it says five. This is a mismatch. Uh, it's the first 10 that I pick out here. They explain more than 75% uh, of the movement. Uh, when you do it with, um, with the values and not with the returns, with the original values, the price values, uh, then you get even for the first uh, component like 90% explanatory power. But let us have a look. So uh, here using only one component, the most, uh, yeah, the, the principal component, so to say, you see that we can uh, already pretty well replicate the performance over time starting in 2010 uh, up until recently. Uh, by this uh, single component. So you see a linear, uh, a good linear combination of the underlying factors provides you already with a high level of uh, explanation here. Uh, using many more doesn't make that much of a difference. We have seen it before. The first 10 stand for like 75% explanatory power. Uh, but again, you see all the kind of rather complex things are applied pretty easily to the pandas data frame. And here the, the, the plotting, for example, you see kind of a row and application of certain methods. Uh, I select two columns out of my data frame, then I calculate the cumulative sum, I apply the scale function, and then the result, which is a data frame, is plotted. Uh, so you see this, a single line of code, as I mentioned before, you have really high level abstraction. Well, I want a cumulative sum, then I apply this and that. So you don't have single steps for that, not procedural. You have really the, uh, the object-oriented, method-based call of that, and this, I think, can even be understood by as I said before, students or non-experts, so you call them probably expert. I mentioned that Python is a good partner when it comes to harnessing the power of the available um, um, yeah, hardware and, and, and the, the capabilities that the hardware as of today provides. So probably a process simulation, something that's also really important for us because this is the case where we simulate stuff in the future when we use Monte Carlo simulation and there is a huge benefit by parallelizing the code I had a similar example in my performance Python talk on Wednesday at EuroPython, uh, and it was mentioned that this is a simple case. Yes, it is a simple case, but it's kind of a, a case that you encounter, at least in finance, quite often, that you have, uh, that you have uh, data and code parallelism in the sense that the same function, the same simulation function has to be executed multiple times, actually, and the data is not like shared or whatever. I want to skip through that. Um, the, the, the function itself is not that, uh, not that interesting, uh, to be honest. Um, here you see a sample simulation. This is kind of, we have worked with historical data. This tries to like mimic a potential future behavior of a stock index or um, of anything else. And graphically, this might look like this, for example. But what is more important, uh, how can we parallelize that? And Python has the built-in module multiprocessing which can be easily used, at least on, on a single local machine. And we all have, as of today, even our notebooks, multiple cores that we can use. If you have maybe a larger server, it's even more efficient. But here what we do is kind of simulate 100 tasks. We do 100 simulations, and I've done this on a server with eight cores. So I, I change uh, the number from one up until eight. So I add one worker after the other to end up with eight cores in the end. And the only thing I have to do is here kind of mapping my function that I've defined previously for the simulation to the data set that I put into the, is similar to the, to the Python map that you might know, like map filter reduce for, for kind of functional programming approach in Python. A uh, couple of lines of coding you see here, the harnessing of the power of multiple cores is pretty easy and you see kind of really um, the, uh, the benefits that the parallelization for this particular example uh, brings. So Python, again, is only a couple of lines of code and it can harness the power that the hardware allows you to do, even in interactive context. There's nothing that has, has to be scheduled or whatsoever. Uh, so as a student, you can sit there and do the same things that I'm doing here. Probably Monte Carlo simulation this is just an example using a class-based implementation for an option pricing formula. Um, not option pricing formula, option pricing approach. A uh, little bit different, but in the end, it boils down to the same thing, a little bit more flexible, just to illustrate that it works with other approaches as well. Again, you see I map my worker, which wraps a method of my, of my object here um, to, again, a set of data. So a little bit different syntax, a little bit different approach, but in the end, it boils down to the very same approach and uh, obviously also to the very same results in the end. 
So lots of data, of course, um, this data parallelism with the lots of data to be simulated uh, makes it necessary that you have enough RAM. So I was running this on a machine with 64 gigabytes of RAM, but still, as of today, 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes are not that expensive anymore. Uh, so this uh, data parallelism is uh, quite easily implemented. Um, another example that I want to show you briefly is processing large CSV files. Uh, and this was uh, brought to me by one of my clients. I said, well, we are sitting from a client being a, a top management consultancy company that we have trained and we have introduced Python. I said, well, we are often sitting at clients and they provide us huge CSV files, but uh, we can't really process them because um, they're like 50 gigabytes large and we only have our machines with four or eight gigabytes of RAM. So they're sitting at the client side with their desktops having no machines and the data is not allowed to like uh, leave the building, if you like. <laughs> so they say, well, uh, using uh, SRS, we can uh, like process these files. I don't know how to do it in, in Python. Then we uh, illustrated that. Um, so this is kind of uh, an example that works with uh, CSV files that are too large to fit into memory, actually. Um, we need a couple of imports, nothing special about that. And what we do here is kind of generate an in-memory data set with, uh, see it here, 10 million uh, rows in the end, random data, part of it uh, integers, part of it um, standard normally distributed, um, and we will now generate a CSV file out of that. And you see writing this 10 times, such that we end up with 100 million rows. This is not big data, I would say, but maybe uh, large data, uh, mid-sized data. Um, takes 22 minutes. So the writing of data out of memory, like using standard uh, Python, writing a text file, putting all the data, throwing all the data in, takes 22 minutes, just as a, as a benchmark value. We delete the original objects, we don't need them anymore. Just having a look at the CSV file, of course, pretty easy to read like the first five lines out of it. Well, this looks like, as intended, we have, uh, we have a, a date time, information, then we have two integers, and then we have two floats. So it's kind of a typical thing that you would encounter, for example, in finance. We have, for example, portfolio positions or whatever, where you say, well, I have uh, 10 products of this, so you have the product ID number, then you have the, the maybe the base currency in euro, and you have the, um, the accounting currency in US, for example. Could be a typical data set. And then you have the movement over time, the changes, and so you end up with a time series, and here we have, again, 100 million uh, lines of uh, such data. Now, what can we do? Reading and writing with pandas is one approach. Um, all we want to do is kind of taking data out of the CSV of the text-based world and storing it in a more convenient format. To this end, uh, pandas, uh, the read CSV function for pandas uh, allows to generate uh, an iterator object such that we don't have to read in the data uh, as a whole. We can do it chunk-wise, as we're used to like by uh, iterating line by line over an open file. So here, but we can do larger chunk size. What I do is kind of uh, 20th of my original file size, n, which was 10 million. Um, so it's kind of not large, but not that small. So we would expect kind of an efficient uh, uh, reading process here. But let us do the reading process. Uh, and here you see reading the data into memory and appending it to our um, disk-based data frame. Here you see. I append it to data chunk um, and get the size of PD name. PD name is the name of the uh, file on disk. It takes five minutes um, and 14 seconds. And the whole process uh, crunches 12 gigabytes of data here in this case. The original data set is six gigabytes large. I have to read in six gigabytes of data and I write to disk six gigabytes of data. And this takes five minutes compared to the 22 minutes for only one direction, if you like, for only the, the, the writing part of that. Um, now we have an HDF5 file, which is called H5 here, with 100 million rows and the five columns, as we've seen before. And this is memory efficient in a sense that it can do it with 50 gigabytes in the same fashion. Of course, it would take a little bit longer. Uh, but it works even on a small desktop if you have enough uh, storage capacity on your HDD or SDD. Now you can do, if now memory allows, this is now I'm like reversing uh, the, 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 the perspective, uh, because I've implemented it not on a machine with four gigabyte, and such a machine, six gigabyte won't fit. It was implemented on the machine with uh, 64 gigabytes. I can do like this based analytics with Panda. So this is uh, six gigabytes large, and I can just call on my object on disk to describe method. You see, this takes three minutes, actually, <laughs> to crunch the data. Uh, because um, pandas doesn't do it like pie tables, it's not like a, a, a 
memory efficient thing that it reads it in, it crunches it, and then provides the result. Um, I can also plot like selected data. You see here I have the, the object on disk. I only take the column which is called flow two. I only take the first ten, uh, the first thousand rows. I apply the cumulative sum method and then I plot it. So again, we have this high level abstraction and single line of code, no procedural, it's kind of single line of code and I get the result for the first thousand uh, values of the flow two column out of my disk base uh, file. Now when I have a look at, at it, we see that it's not kind of uh, uh, stored in a fashion that we would like it. This is only important to understand the pie tables example that come. You see here that we have a values block 0, 1, 2. So this is not kind of a stringent um, storage procedure from my point of view. This could be improved for performance reasons because you see the two float columns and the two integer columns are like mingled together. Uh, so this uh, prevents a couple of uh, maybe useful analytical approaches. but. Let us see how it could work when we only use pie tables. Here in this case, using pie tables, similar thing, we open a file for writing, uh, we define a, a complex data type, numpy data type, for the date, integer column, flow column, and so forth. Uh, this data type we use to create a table using a little bit of compression here, compression level two and the PLOSC um, compression library. And what we do here right now is again using the iterator object from the read CSV function uh, provided by pandas. Actually, but now we are not storing it in the pandas data frame on disk. Now we are storing the data that we retrieve from disk into a PyTables table. And you see this is uh, equally fast, 4 minutes, 28 seconds. Again, 12 gigabytes crunched, 22 minutes for the CSV file. One direction, here we have the two directions in four minutes, 28 seconds. Now having a look at the data on disk, we see we now have the clear structure that we would like to have. Five columns, typical tables, kind of the original data looks like now in pie tables um, as we would like to have it and not like commingled or something uh, by, um, by pandas. This data on disk can now be used like any Python object, like any NumPy and the array, ob uh, and the array object that I, sl I can do slicing row-wise, for example. Uh, this is all on disk uh, that I can select kind of the row-wise thing and then only um, uh, the data points stored in date, for example. Um, I can, <laughs> for example, calculate the length. I don't have to do it. There's metadata, but just to illustrate it, kind of an aggregation operation uh, here in this case. Um, and this is pretty efficient given, the, re given the, the point that it's uh, out of memory. And here you see also the 3.7 uh, seconds for taking the sum over a whole column or the mean over a whole column, similar operation, similar performance, if you like. Um, and also some SQL-like, as I like to call them, conditions and queries can be added. That I say, well, give me all the values of the flow two column for every row that um, um, that fulfills the following conditions, flow one is greater than three, and integer two is smaller than a thousand, and so forth. So you can have out of memory operations which are really, really efficient uh, on data sets that are pretty large, and this can be even implemented on machines again where the data set might not fit into memory, and this was actually what I was asked, and it, it, it's pretty, pretty helpful when you say, well, I have stored the data in that format and I can, I'm only interested in kind of only chunks of the data. And this, of course, improves performance. I think Francesc uh, mentioned a couple of these approaches in this regard also in his talk. Uh, and he's given a talk after me, I think. So you will learn more about all these uh, nice approaches uh, in his talk, actually. Conclusions, Python and libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, PyTables, nothing new to you. I just wanted to illustrate how they are used as of today or can be beneficially used in financial context, provide useful means and approaches to work with large, even big financial data in some circumstances. I think the, um, the libraries and the Python world itself, so there has a couple of very, very powerful advantages, kind of the high level abstraction you've seen. We haven't had that much kind of queries or plotting commands with multiple lines. It was only a single line of code typically. Numerical performance is usually pretty high. So we can get usually um, to the speeds of C when we're doing it right. Uh, not always, of course, this, this is not the point, but if you're doing it right, it is performant and uh, often performant enough is what counts and I.O. performance, which is also pretty, pretty important at least in a, in a financial context, um, it's also getting better and better. In pie tables, for example, uh, pandas in that sense makes it pretty convenient to harness the power of today's hardware. And again, I'm mentioning here kind of uh, the two or one gigabyte uh, reading writing speeds that uh, today's SSDs 
can bring to the table in a sense, uh, even at low prices, as low that even researchers and, and uh, universities can afford to use them. Thanks for your attention. More than happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Eve, for that interesting talk. Um, perhaps we have time for one or two questions. Uh, there is a microphone over there. Um, if you don't want to use it, um, we'll have to repeat the question. I'm just interested in what's missing at the moment. So in terms of infrastructure for planning. In terms of? Uh, the in terms Uh, the question is, what is missing at the moment uh, in terms of infrastructure? Um, from my point of view, not that much. Uh, what is missing in a certain sense, and we've been working with a couple of large financial institutions in this regard, is kind of um, all the, let's say, enterprise-oriented application frameworks to deploy Python applications. I, at the moment, I don't have the feeling that there's that much missing on an analytical, scientific level. The scientific stack is already uh, well worst. Uh, if you want to point uh, to something missing there, it's kind of two things, the documentation, and maybe related to that kind of changing APIs over time. So Pandas, for example, as nice as it is, from one version to the other, you always have to update your code. And this is nothing that uh, institutions would like to have. You know, it's kind of a, you always want to be at the current state, but uh, you don't want to update the API. It's documentation and also support, but there are companies like Continuum Analytics, for example, or Enthought, that provide distributions where you can also get professional support. So this is getting better. But from my point of view, what I see in from discussions kind of the, what people are used from the Java world, you know, it's kind of these multi-million projects where they have these used application servers and infrastructures. And so everything around when you want to do it on large scale, this is not that good at the moment as it could be. But uh, again, we have done lots of things in this regard for financial institutions, and I think in the future this will be better as well. There was one other question, maybe. Yeah. Um, as far as Yeah, I'm pretty sure. There are a couple of reasons. Uh, the question is, um, in the analytics space, uh, most banks use C++ for um, implementing computationally demanding and performance critical um, analytical tasks. And this is, uh, I mean, the recent past it was kind of one of the, the only choices that allowed you uh, to do it in, a, in an efficient and performant way. Uh, at a time when Python hasn't had Thyson, number, and all the things that I presented on Wednesday in my performance Python talk. Um, I think Python, as of today, has all the ingredients, as what I was saying before. Uh, if you would start to implement an analytics library for derivatives, uh, CBA analytics, risk analytics, whatever, um, you would better go with Python and using all the things that are available right now. It makes it, I think, by a factor of two, three, four, five more efficient than doing it in C++, also maintenance and so forth. Why do banks stick to their analytics libraries? I mean, this is... Uh, like almost always a legacy thing. A large investment bank having a complex product heavily traded over a couple of years, you might have a single class, single kind of valuation kernel, if you like, for this one uh, financial product that might have 120,000 lines of code in C++, where multiple developers are maintaining this single piece of the library. Uh, though this is not that easy to replace. Even if you say, well, in Python, this will be only, let's say, 15,000 lines of code, and it would be as performant, but it is in production, it, is, it runs. You know, it's kind of, this is a, a legacy thing in the end. Uh, many, many hedge funds as of today, quant hedge funds, uh, doing trading, risk, and so forth, are starting out with Python when they can start out, when they start out from scratch. If there's something that they encounter which is still too slow in Python for whatever reason, then they use Boost or whatever to like integrate C++ and interface with C using Thyson, all the approaches. Um, that's fine, but overall, I mean, Bank of America is a good example, having 10 million lines of Python code in production for the risk management platform. Um, it works, but analytics, again, I agree with you, is in C++, but mainly due to the fact that you have more people who can do C++ and analytics, you have legacy code and you have, yeah, of course, what we all know out of uh, all the corporations uh, that we might have in mind. 
Okay, so let's thank Eve once again. Thank you.